Hello everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we'll listen to the second part of the memoirs of German Colonel Stadel Lutpold, Regimental Commander of Paulus's 6th Army. We set out on an all-terrain vehicle to scout the terrain east of Verdiaki in the direction of Mitrievka, where the command post of the division is located. We are accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Wernberg, commander of the artillery division attached to our regiment. It is necessary that he at our new battle site to determine the firing positions for the six guns we have left. Only we left Verdiaki as Soviet attack aircraft swept over the settlement. The bombs hit the clusters of soldiers and wagon transports, inflicting heavy losses on us. The soldiers are again looking for salvation in the open field. Our defense must now be built differently than on the south bank of the Don, between Kletskaya and near Perikaka. Although here, on the outskirts of Cossack Kurgan, in the summer of the first attempt to take Stalingrad, heavy fighting was fought, and the area is dotted with rifle cells, small dugouts, firing positions and ammunition storage bunkers, but all this because of the continuous movement of troops is almost in complete disrepair. Meanwhile, frosty weather had set in. A sharp westerly wind is driving snowflakes on the ground and whirling snowflakes. Only a few knolls stand out on the terrain. The soldiers will have to take up defenses here on terrain that has no natural cover. This means that for machine gunners, forward observers, Riflemen and mortarmen, the only shelter will be snow trenches. For telephonists and orderlies, it may be possible to tidy up an old dugout or two. Supply of the regiment, as well as evacuation of the wounded, will be possible only at night, and this with a multi kilometer route. Now and then, Soviet attack aircraft swoop down on columns withdrawing from Verdiaki and Peskoveka. Even the slightest clusters of people are destroyed. Our anti-aircraft artillery is not heard, and the aviation does not appear, so manifests our helplessness and the superiority of the enemy. The further way lies on rugged terrain through sand dunes and snow-covered fields to the two mounds visible on the horizon, where the command post of the division should be located. The air is clear and clean, and one can distinguish tanks with a simple eye, which, as if they were dots, move towards each other stop, fire, and move back. The impression is like being in a puppet theater. Gradually, the vast empty space begins to seem ominous. It is impossible to ascertain where our batteries are firing from, where the tanks are coming from, and where they disappear to. Only columns of smoke sometimes indicate the direction of the battle. The road leading to Dmitrievka is full of craters. We are blocked by tangles of tangled wire. This is all that is left of the main telephone line to the city on the Volga. Because of the craters and wires, we are forced to turn off the road and take a detour through the field. There are dead horses everywhere, a sign of panic retreat. Suddenly, we come across a collection point for the wounded. They're waiting to be dispatched. They call out to us, demanding that we stop, for we shall be discovered. A very energetic officer with a gendarme badge on his breast explains to us that we cannot move any further and that in case of disobedience he has orders to use weapons. Then he says in a low voice, but very insistently, Please understand that we can only hold on here if we are not discovered. The Russians are shelling everything. They are firing even at individual soldiers. They have an exceptionally good view. We can't see them at all. After a few minutes the first shells burst, so we have to hide for a long time. Finally, we can move on. After a few kilometers we find a divisional command post dug into a sandy hill. In the abandoned shelter, a candle smokes. They don't pay attention to us. Every now and then the phone rings. They're transmitting battle reports. There are pleas for help. I hear the phone ringing. Impossible. We've already lost twenty men. The Russians have broken through. Immediately open fire on hollow X south of Peskovaka. Fresh Russian troops are pushing us back from the Don Ridge to the river. Anxiety is growing, especially when you hear that the Soviet troops, skillfully, using the terrain, seek to take the initial positions from where they could break into the supposed system of our strongholds at night. 
However, this is a tactic that we have already experienced enough of. First at the Yelninskaya Bulge, and six weeks ago at Lugovsky, when Russian reconnaissance forced a hasty withdrawal not only of us, but also of the divisional command post. Eventually, I hear scraps of conversation that revolve around the issue of the shift. It is clear that every military unit that is here in positions east of the dawn, after heavy fighting and marching inside the cauldron, would like to be replaced. The talk is that the change of units should be provided with artillery barrage. Colonel Kerr, commander of the artillery regiment of the division, nervously drumming his fingers on the table. After all, it is known that we are surrounded, and now we must save every shell. Divisional command post is in the trenches, almost in the open air. There's a lot of crowding here. The wounded are also coming in, demanding help. You can hear them talk fervently about the fighting, still in the power of the experience. A phrase comes to me, it can't go on like this for long. In the midst of this turmoil appeared, and we with the intention to conduct a personal reconnaissance of the area were to enter into battle our regiment. When I say that I would like to personally visit the headquarters stationed in threatened positions, it is met with an expression of doubt. We hear the word impossible again. One cannot take a step here during the day. With the onset of darkness it will be possible to act. We study the map, draw the situation, clarify the numerical and combat composition of the regiment, figure out how to use the batteries of Fernberg. The division was left without artillery because of a direct hit by a large aircraft bomb. Five guns completely out of action. That's why the officers of the division headquarters treat us as saviors. Corps headquarters promised that the arrival of rested units that will occupy the defense site. The division command would like to withdraw badly battered troops. For some time I listen in silence. Chief of Operations Division Headquarters shows understanding, especially with regard to the time factor. Then, as hard as it is for me to deprive him of hope, I report on the state of my regiment, the recent fighting on the dawn, and the rapid march. I emphasize that all the soldiers are ragged and exhausted to the last degree, so that, in fact, they are only capable of gathering at Verdiaki or in a neighboring district. Therefore, in the most extreme case, I can only field a battalion of about 250 men. And when can you be here? The earliest is tomorrow, at 2 o'clock midnight, and not an hour earlier. That means you'll barely have time to get into position before dawn. Then the chief of operations, overlapping the voices of the officers, pale from a sleepless night, says, Gentlemen, it is necessary under all circumstances to hold out until tomorrow morning. You have heard that the shift cannot arrive earlier. The fact is that the next twelve hours will be really decisive. Remember we've gotten out of more difficult situations. It'll be dark in two hours. Just wait two hours and the task will be accomplished. Turning to me, he adds with some relief. We've had this mess going for four days now. When we returned to Verdiaki in the evening, there was waiting for us a new written order of the division, left by the adjutant. The adjutant himself had already departed with the battery commanders to reconnoiter a new section of defense between Peskovaka and Mitrivka. It was now out of the question to change units in the section that had been thoroughly reconnoitered during the day. The command has gone mad, bursts out from Vernberg. He loses his usual restraint and correctness. What can be objected to him? As a matter of fact, I am of the same opinion. It is best to keep silent about the reconnaissance. Needless to say, everything is going wrong in the higher headquarters. In any case, now we know how things are at our positions. The Russians are constantly attacking our defensive lines. Large forces of the Red Army are striking from the area of Kakulinskaya. Does the leaflet tell the truth? Verdiaki is deserted, as is Peskovaka, in which in the last few days the same thing has played out as in Verdiaki and in other settlements on both sides of the Don. Areas of retreat turned into areas of defensive fighting against the closing ring. Soviet air raids did their work. Everyone who could fled and now appear here at night in order to replenish supplies, get firewood, something to organize, a stretching concept that covers everything from the allowed to the unallowed. 
the instinct of self-preservation becomes more and more pronounced. Before evening, Soviet leaflets are dropped on our positions. Frontillistrate, with caricatures of generals wearing knight's crosses and Prussian-type officers armed with monocles I throw aside. It doesn't touch me. But there is another leaflet here, not too flashy in design, but the more significant in content. On it, there is a schematic map, roughly shaded Stalingrad, and two thick black pincers. The Soviet front, covering Stalingrad in a wide arc and joining it Kalak. In addition, the map shows powerful arrows, which south of the Don are directed to the Chur and south of Stalingrad from the Solonchek steppe. On the river Aksai Kermoyarsky, it is shown that our front is broken through. Underneath it all is a short text. You are surrounded. Resistance is pointless. Lay down your arms. Are the Russians telling the truth? Is the catastrophe really that big? Is it true, or is it a propaganda trick, a crude trickery to cause confusion? And how, finally, does this leaflet fit in with the summary of the Wormitched High Command, which we had just recently received via our camp radio station? The days that followed taught us not to be so quick to dismiss the schematic maps on the Soviet leaflets as a propaganda trick. Soviet strike groups advanced from Golubinskaya and Kakalinskaya, pushed us back from the dawn, and pushed us back 15 to 20 kilometers to positions near Cossack Barrow. The area of the cauldron was significantly reduced. Surrender Stalingrad. Even before we had equipped the positions intended for circular defense near the chain of hills near Dmitrievka, there were reports, albeit ill-founded, about the anticipated German offensive to unblock. It was from these reports that many of our soldiers and officers in general first learned about the seriousness of the situation and a complete encirclement of the Sixth Army. By this time, even we, the regimental commanders, were also not sufficiently aware of the extent of the catastrophe. As sad as it is to admit it, the officers and soldiers who came from the rear, which now meant from Stalingrad, knew the most. No one, however, could verify whether everything they were telling was true. Soon any doubt disappears. It turns out that from the north and northwest all our troops are cut off from their rear services. Consequently, we can no longer count on supplies. It was already risky to supply an entire army on a single-track railway line, which in addition had a very vulnerable place, a 24-ton bridge over the Don at Verkhnchurskaya. However, now this is over. From where to get spare parts, ammunition, weapons, engineering equipment, if the main supply base and its branches are in the Kharkov area, and in the city itself, and between us and this area, the Red Army, great importance is now attached to limitations and improvisation. The more willingly are perceived unexpectedly spread rumors of an impending attempt to break through from the outside. And already on the night of November 24 to 25 there are company commanders who claim as if from several particularly advantageously located observation points they manage to see signs of the appearance of our troops. The basis for such claims were distant explosions and alternating flashes of light from fires, all from the western side of the Don Ridge, near Peskovaka and Verdiakhi. About two kilometers southwest of Dmitrievka can be particularly well observed to the southwest, in the direction of Golubinsky, and moreover far in front of the defensive area of the left neighbor, the 3rd Motorized Division. Allegedly the same signs were seen there as well. Therefore, the idea of a breakthrough, to break out of the ring of encirclement, begins to take more and more possession of minds. Among the officers, as well as on the front line in the snow trenches and rifle cells begin to build calculations and discuss the possibilities. The mood rises, again appears confidence, trust in the command, forgotten the terrible impressions of the beginning of disorganization. We will not be abandoned to the mercy of fate. And in addition, behind us is Stalingrad, a huge city, where, despite the great destruction, are the appropriate headquarters. Yes, everything will be as it should be. And if it is true that the army is surrounded, then it has such firepower that the Russians will be exsanguinated. One way or another, but the question of encirclement will be solved somehow. After all, 
no one was left to their fate at Demyansk. In any case, again found the ground under their feet. All slept or will sleep at night. There is a decent portion of pasta with meat in the cauldron. There are dry cigarettes and bread, even rum in the tea. Where did the headquarters organize all this from? They say that the intendant of the headquarters has connections everywhere from the Don to Stalingrad. That's all the wisdom. In fact, it is sad that during such conversations and arguments they do not remember with a single word that one of them was killed, another was killed without a leg, and the third was left lying somewhere with a shattered shoulder, and that the lieutenant on the bridge was crushed by a tank. Immediately after we take up our positions, General Von Daniels comes to us. He confirms that the rumors about the operation to get out of the encirclement have a real basis. Even on the first day, when the Russians broke through, Paulus requested from the Supreme Command of Land Forces permission to withdraw the army behind the Don and outlined the breakthrough from the encirclement on November 24. However, Hitler's radiogram prevented the realization of this plan. Hitler assured that the supply of the army will be provided by air, and the operation to deblock will be undertaken at an appropriate time. Cork's commanders approved of Paulus's decision to abandon the breakthrough under these circumstances. After all, being in the ring, it is impossible not to reckon with what is happening on the entire Eastern Front. The Sixth Army is not in a position to judge how the surrender of Stalingrad would affect Army Group A, the Central Front, and even the Northern Front. Only one man, von Daniels reported strictly in confidence, did not join the general decision. Von Siedlitz Referring to his experience in the Dimian Cauldron, he favored going into action immediately, not even stopping short of disobeying orders. As if this was possible for the German military. However, the troops of the deblocking group are already concentrated. The operation could begin in a few days. At some point, the Sixth Army will have to make a strong blow to meet the tank wedge deblocking group. The relevant orders in general terms have already been communicated to the commanders. What does that mean, supplying an entire army by air? After all, it is. But on the other hand, the idea of breaking through the ring from the outside and inside at the same time is attractive. It seems a real opportunity to break out of the ring, which is getting tighter by the hour, as the Red Army does not leave us alone, especially at night. We feel it in our section south of Hill 137, which has evidently become the axis of the front's turn eastward to the Volga at Rink. On either side of the hill, around height 137, is the 376th Infantry Division, followed by our right neighbor, the 44th Infantry Division. The left neighbor, the 3rd Motorized Division, is prepared, apparently, to conduct a very active defense common to mechanized troops. Its tactic is to advance in some direction by fire, clear enemy positions by vigorous fighting even before they are stabilized, and then retake a convenient starting position, defending it with mortars, anti-tank guns, or even, as in our case, 88mm anti-aircraft guns. It was the 8-8, the most effective weapon against the T-34, became a true pillar of our defense. After all, without sufficient anti-tank means it is impossible to repel attacks, which are undertaken mainly at dawn or at night from the Don Valley through snow-covered fields. The first bitter experience forced us to adapt each forward observation post for a circular defense. In addition, our units, retreating with battles from Middle Perikopka to Dmitrievka, suffered heavy losses and must receive replenishment, consisting of the remnants of broken military units collected after fleeing from the west to the area of Stalingrad. It will not be possible to restore order among them immediately. The soldiers of the rear services are not at all prepared for fighting in open positions. In addition, they are unlikely to be satisfied with such a use of them. But for the motorized riflemen, being sent to us means a completely new situation. For the first time, they will have to undergo a severe test without a protective cover over their heads and without a warm shelter. Because of this, there is a lot of excitement in the units, and I know that, in truth, our defenses are held up only by the old non-commissioned officers, as well as by the middle-ranking officers. These days we commanders know no rest day or night. 
Conducting defensive fighting requires a thorough knowledge of the terrain, which cannot be obtained by studying a map alone. Our defense is located on the edge of a former training field, on which there are skillfully constructed systems of trenches, firing positions, and other training facilities. Although these systems of fortifications are for the most part covered with deep snow, the enemy attempts to exploit them. Part of the time he succeeds at night in coming close to our only still being equipped positions. And yet, in spite of everything, we must move to an active defense to show that our divisions and regiments are not at all forced to abandon any initiative. Unfounded Attempts About November 26 came the order to reassign our 376th Infantry Division to the XIV Tank Corps under Lt. Gen. Hubei. The same applies to our left neighbor, the 3rd Motorized Division, commanded by Lt. Gen. Schlemmer. Lt. Gen. Hubei I know. Before the war, as head of the military school in Dresden, he became famous for publishing a considerable number of works on tactics. During the exercises for commanders and teachers of military schools, we repeatedly had occasion to see that this is a lively and very mobile man. Therefore, we could assume that our section very soon distinguished themselves well thought out, exemplary organization of defense. True, we still knew almost nothing about the situation in the south of the cauldron, but we learned how things go on the northwestern and northern sections of the front, where our right neighbor was the 44th Infantry Division of the VI Army Corps. Our former XI Corps under the command of General Strecker was now subordinated to the Corps Group under the command of General von Siedlitz. In its composition transferred to the 24th, 16th Panzer, and 60th Motorized Division, which defended the northern section. At about the same time, a new Army Group Don is created under the command of Field Marshal Manstein, who had previously commanded the 11th Army and enjoyed great authority among officers and soldiers. This group of armies will be subordinate to the encircled 6th Army. All believe that now, when the head is put such a man, we can be sure that the ring of encirclement will be broken. Manstein's name alone is a guarantee that the crisis situation will turn into a victory. Why cry about a second Moscow? Moscow will not be repeated. Do not the regroupings at our place, and apparently, everywhere in the cauldron serve as proof to anyone versed in military affairs that a change is being prepared. Manstein was indeed tasked with the task of retrieving us. However, the November offensive of the Red Army had such serious consequences for the entire southern section of the front that the operation to unblock was able to start 14 days later than originally planned, and despite the initial successes, it failed. Manstein cannot compensate for the heavy November losses from his own reserves. He has to wait until the Eastern Front will arrive from Brittany's 6th Panzer Division. Due to the actions of Soviet partisans on the railroad lines, its arrival is delayed until the first week of December. Therefore, Manstein is forced to postpone the deblocking strike until mid-December. For this operation under the command of Colonel General Gotha, commander of the 4th Panzer Army, are designed LVI Tank Corps with 23rd and 6th Panzer Divisions, as well as the 15th Airfield Division. They are attached to four Romanian infantry divisions and the remnants of two Romanian cavalry divisions, but only transferred from France, the 6th Panzer Division has almost full combat power. Manstein intended to form two strike groups, the first in the area of Kotelnikov, with the task of seizing the heights 50 kilometers southwest of Stalingrad, and from there to establish communication with the southern section of the front of the cauldron, and the second in the area of Tormosin with the task, using the still available German bridgehead at Nizhenchurskaya, to break the ring of encirclement on its southwestern phase at Marinovka and Karpovka. About the same time timed our diversionary offensive in the direction from Ferdiaki to Milarovo. We are still betting on German formations between the Don and the Chur, which are supposedly not only able to resist the enemy who has broken through to the depths, but also to launch a counter-offensive in the eastern direction, although there are no concrete and definite data for such an assumption. The rumor about this is fed by the fact that we all know about the presence of a bridgehead at Nizhenchurskaya. The second bridgehead, 
at Nemkovsky, Lashki, and Richkovsky, still leaves open the way to the east bank of the Don. And our left neighbor, the 3rd Motorized Division, at Maranaka is only 40 kilometers from this bridgehead. The order to attack is expected on December 12. Operation Winter Storm While the strike group in the area of Tormosinane only fails to go on the offensive, but has to fight heavy defensive battles at Nizhenchurskaya, LVI Tank Corps of Army Group, Goth, having in the vanguard of the 6th Tank Division, manages on December 12 to advance along the railway line, Tikoritskaya Stalingrad, and during the next three days to reach the boundary of the river Aksai Yesolovsky. The battle groups are allegedly followed by convoys with several thousand tons of ammunition, fuel and food for the encircled troops. At the same time, the Chief of Staff of the 6th Army, Major General Schmidt should concentrate in the area Karpovka, Rakotino, behind the southwestern front of the cauldron, compounds with the task of advancing towards Goth and form a corridor between the deblocking army and the cauldron. This strike wedge is attached to the still effective tanks of the 6th Army, as well as parts of the 3rd and 29th Motorized and 295th Infantry Divisions, which should provide the corridor and right and left. Vehicles with a total payload of 700 tons have the task from Karpovka to follow the tanks and take over the supply of Gotha's group. The II Air Corps should drop fuel and ammunition for the tanks in the corridor. From day to day, we are waiting for the order to break through. The operation was codenamed Thunderstroke. The situation in the cauldron is getting worse and inspires serious fears. The combat effectiveness of troops is also decreasing as a result of hunger, frostbite, disease, the degree of attrition of personnel every day is becoming more and more threatening, especially since there will be forced march of 30 to 40 kilometers. The gap between the carrying capacity of transport and the growing number of wounded and sick reaches such a magnitude that forced to abandon the original plan to take with them all those who are unable to go. But the order to begin the operation, Thunderstrike, still does not come even after December 19, when Manstein gave Paulus the order to bring in readiness forces intended for the breakthrough. By this time, not only had Gotha's offensive at Verkenkumskoy and Kruglakov been stopped, but the armies of the Soviet Voronezh and Southwestern fronts had forced the Middle Don between Veshinskaya and Novaya Kalitva, defeated the German positions and defenses of the 8th Italian Army and rushed south. It is clear to us that we can no longer count on the unblocking from the west. It seems doubtful that the 17th and 6th Panzer Divisions of the Gotha Group, in a new attempt to get through with a fight, and at us in the cauldron as a result of increased fatigue of people and losses of material, and before unfavorable conditions for a successful breakthrough even more deteriorated. Everyone doubts that it is possible to break through from the cauldron without simultaneous further advance of Gotha. True, the LVI tank corps manages with persistent fighting to move somewhat to the northeast, and by December 23 to gain a foothold on the boundary of the Mishkova River near Vasilyevka. There are air and tank battles, in which both sides fight with extreme tension and suffer heavy losses. Then the Soviet counteroffensive under the command of General Eremenko in a few days throws Gotha's troops far to the southwest. Operation Winter Storm failed. The fate of the 6th Army is decided. German soldiers, participants of the Battle of Stalingrad, survivors, will always remember Manstein's radiograms. Hold on, I will get through to you. Hold on, we are advancing. Unable to draw the right conclusions from the entire course of the Eastern Campaign, first of all from the defeat near Moscow and correctly assess the enemy's forces, its strategic and tactical capabilities, Manstein, for the sake of his criminal vanity, sacrificed not only the 6th Army, but also the lives of tens of thousands of German, Italian, and Romanian soldiers, who in those December days of 1942 died in the Don and Volga steppes, near Kantemirovka, in the area of Alexivo Lozovsko, near Verkin, Cherskaya, Tormosin, Kotelnikov, Paulus realized that independent breakthrough from the encirclement was possible only in the first days, 
But such a breakthrough, as well as the Operation Thunderstroke, he did not want to undertake without a direct order from the general command of the ground forces. He was refused twice, and he and his army remained in the fortress of Stalingrad. Even later in the prisoner of war camp, and on his return to Dresden, Paulus confirmed his deep conviction that the Sixth Army's stubborn resistance constrained significant forces of the Red Army, and that therefore it was very important to hold out at least one extra day. Therefore he could not take the responsibility for leaving the encirclement, nor, later, to capitulate at his own risk. However, the commander of our XIV Panzer Corps, General Hube in early January, supported the opinion of Paulus, as if being in Stalingrad, it is impossible to assess the development of hostilities on other fronts. After a personal report in the Fuhrer's headquarters, Hoob reported on January 7 that Hitler confirmed the order of the Sixth Army to defend Stalingrad to the last, even if the question will be, in the end, only to hold the city itself. Under all circumstances, he stated, it was necessary to buy time to stabilize the situation on the Southern Front. With the participation of Army Group A formations, a new offensive was planned to unblock the encircled army. Hubio reported this on January 7, one day before the Soviet surrender offer, three days before the Red Army launched its decisive offensive. Meeting the dead. On the elevated western section of the encirclement front, there is stubborn fighting for the so-called Cossack Kurgan, considered the key of the ring of defense. From it you can control the crossings across the Don. Fighting for these heights, for height 102, at which three German divisions were killed, or for height 129, around which my regiment is entrenched, requires great sacrifices. How often I made my way from the regimental command post to the disposition of my companies. Day and night, during blizzards, and also in fog, when nothing could be distinguished for ten paces. If you ride a motorcycle from Nitrivka up a gentle rise, where everything is covered with smooth ice and the path is blocked by doom-like snowdrifts, you have to turn on low speed. The road is broken by thousands of soldiers walking uncertainly, groping. Everyone who struggles to make his way forward passes corpses that used to lie about a hundred paces south of the road. Each day they get closer. The dead move closer to the living. It's a terrible picture. The snow that today covers the corpses like a shroud is swept away the next day by a chilling storm, and the corpses are stretched toward the heavens in the postures in which life has left them. A field strewn with dead bodies is indescribably frightening. You look with horror at the exposed limbs, the torn rib cages, the cramped arms. And every time I can't take my eyes off this terrible sight. The dead faces of recently carefree youths or older soldiers, yesterday still full of energy, now their faces are frozen in a mournful grimace, and beneath their bushy eyebrows are glazed, weeping eyes. In the name of what did they accept death? In the name of what did they die aimlessly? No one should turn away from this sight. No one should pass by, and let the oppressive questions never rest. Here are the sky-blue dead eyes. On a dark night a lineman will shine a flashlight, and they will suddenly sparkle, reminding of life. But it is not only the wind and weather that change the appearance of this field. The soldiers themselves encroach on the dead, friend or foe. If you walk through the field of death after dark, you see an ominous picture of the robbery of the dead. They, the soldiers, are still ashamed of each other, and they rob the dead at night. Here are glimpses of shadows kicking dead bodies with their boots or pulling them by their arms or legs. Now and then a match is lit as a marauder lights a cigarette. Here are two or three soldiers trying to pull the boots off a dead man. They don't succeed immediately. The boot needs a whole boot, so they use a knife or an axe, and the foot and the boot are separated from the dead body. They do not answer to shouts. They sneak. They turn their backs and under the cover of darkness disappear silently, treading on the corpses. Once I captured one of these and took him with me. He is a middle-aged soldier, a clerk by profession, a father of two children. He stands before me, narrow-chested, thin, in his overcoat pocket a piece of bread, a couple of crumpled dirty cigarettes soaked with melt water, 
and a broken comb. All this he took from the dead. I let him go. A few days later, my contact got a new pair of boots. The brisk young man does not hesitate to tell me that these boots were worth several hours of work on the sweat of the dead. Then another soldier has a thick gray woolen scarf with fringe and knots. True, the scarf is torn in one place, and though it is from the field of the dead, but it is warm, very warm. The third one is a thick cotton jacket with brownish-red bloodstains on the back. But it protects him from the wind, and after all, it is the very thing he has been looking for for a long time, in the field of the dead. There are naked corpses left in the field of the dead, and it looks even more terrifying. Among the dead stands a full-length, glaciated corpse with an arm and a leg thrown up like a wooden blowhard. The wind is ruffling the end of the bandage on his thigh, which the wounded man is coiled in the hope of escape. From afar, it seems that among the dead stands a living man. Yes, that's the way it is. Corpses live. Remind us. Look at us, the dead, the dead of Cossack Kurgan, height 129, the cemetery of tanks, the ravines near Platina and Gold, the dawn, Kletskaya. They remind each of us, and everyone who walks past the field of the dead, tilts his head and involuntarily thinks about himself. So we are not worth more, so we don't deserve any more. They rob you like this, they desecrate your icy courts like this. It's not true that all soldiers become insensitive and indifferent to such experiences. They become more withdrawn, silent, not indifferent at all. They simply do not have enough words to express their feelings. For hours they sit silently by the fires, watching the all-consuming fire burning brightly, but they do not express their feelings in any way. And there is no difference between soldiers and officers in the face of death. Now she is always with us. Soon we'll have a normal relationship with her. At least we think so. We think, but we don't say, because each of us avoids showing emotion towards the other if we hear that someone has been killed. We deceive ourselves. As a matter of fact, we all tremble at the thought that the exact same fate as the inhabitants of the field of the dead inevitably awaits us. When a division order or a telegram mentions how well the soldiers are doing in their snow trenches, I am indignant. All this is easy to say when one is sitting in a bunker, at least having a roof over one's head, in warmth, when one can eat with clean hands, and most importantly, can walk around the field of the dead. But the infantryman on Cossack Mount has been living among the corpses for weeks. Corpses on his right, corpses on his left, corpses beside him corpses under him or under his rifle. All attempts to bury the dead have failed, although we have experienced gravediggers. In mid-September, in the northern bend of the Don between Kremenskaya and near Perikopka, near Hill 199, we buried the dead right in the trenches, in which we ourselves sat crouched down. And while the communicators were ciphering reports and banging keys, Messengers were dragging the bodies of our dead comrades from the abandoned positions, squeezing them between the radio equipment into shallow shooting cells, and covering them with earth. Already in a few hours at our command post, they confused graves with trenches, or even sat on a thin layer of earth, which sprang, because under it lay a body that had not even had time to cool down. And then they argued heatedly whether it was possible to inform the relatives of the dead that their relatives were buried in cemeteries. Here, in the cauldron, everything looks different. He who does not fall himself into his own snow trench does not die there, and he is not snowed in, he remains on the field. Graves were dug only in the first days, and a cemetery with wooden crosses, inscriptions, and a high four-meter oak cross appeared but this lasted only a few days. But there were no longer enough people alive to dig graves for the dead and make crosses, and the ground froze deeper and deeper. The fact that a cemetery had been set up at the entrance to Dmitrievko was a topic of conversation, but who in our desperate situation would ask what was appropriate and what was not? On small sledges made of rough boards, in the evenings, food is brought to the snow trenches, which are called positions, and on the way back, 
they load the stiffened corpses on them. Ammunition is delivered to the firing positions of mortars and anti-tank guns by sledges at night, and the seriously wounded are taken to the forward dressing station. Passing by the cemetery, they see if the wounded still shows signs of life. If so, he is dragged to the sanitary bunker. If not, they take him to the cemetery with the dead without any formalities. Thus a field of the dead is formed from the dead lying in rows. Hundreds and hundreds of corpses lie next to each other or on top of each other. And these stacks of corpses are looted, stripped, like cars in a junkyard, taking away the engine block or the chassis, dismantling what is needed. There's almost no difference. Everything here is free. One only needs to come to terms with the piercing cold and frozen human blood. Heart and mind must be silent, and the soldiers desperately search for explanations for what is happening. Mountains of corpses are growing before their eyes. This plunges them into even greater despair, and in front of their mental gaze there are torn clouds as one might see on a stormy night. The moon rises, then it hides behind dark, bizarre clouds, finally disappears altogether, and a dark, black-blue abyss opens up in the infinite distance. And on the boundless snow-covered steppe suddenly appear then light, then gloomy outlines of fantastic figures. So in the snowy desert near Dmitrievka the pictures of the past came to mind, and dead people and cemeteries flashed before my eyes. All the time cemeteries, crosses and graves, endless rows, and there is no escape from it. For as soon as you step out of a miserable dugout into the frosty air, you immediately find yourself in a gigantic cemetery. And haven't these snow-covered heights and valleys, soaked with blood, long ago become an endless graveyard? A shiver runs through me. Today I, with Wernberg, Fries, String, and Urban, calculated the numerical and combat composition of the regiment. We can't go on like this. Losses of the regiment, artillery, Communications and air defense units are unaccountable. A soldier's ration is two pieces of bread a day, a portion of liquid soup, two or three cups of coffee or tea. Who can stand it for long? And that's the state in which we celebrate Christmas. What are they all thinking about? Soldiers sitting in snowy trenches, young lieutenants, artillerymen living between the carriages of anti-aircraft guns and ammunition boxes, a service on scorched earth. Christmas is only two days away, and we will once again wish each other happiness and good luck, knowing full well that these are all empty words. I have already met Christmas several times at the front, and I know that even during the holidays there are flares, shooting, hand grenades exploding, and people dying. And at the same time in churches they are praying to God, asking for peace on earth, of course, after the victory is won. And this service takes place during a time of war, when deliberate killing is taking place on an unprecedented scale. The earth is turning into a scorched desert and mothers are losing their children. The word worship sounds blasphemous in the mouths of those who are responsible for all these atrocities. What does faith, which appeals to the heart and conscience, have to do with it? This is probably the reason why many soldiers and officers attend Wehrmacht services, just as they did in the First World War. An inner necessity forces them to think of themselves. They try to withdraw into themselves for a moment, even if the gun cannonade rattles on during these hours. Involuntarily my lips whisper a prayer I heard from my grandmother in my early childhood. Have mercy, God. I think of the service after the procession from the Church of the Baptism of Our Lord in Tofkirchen on the Vilso to Alfraunhofen, a small lower Bavarian pilgrim town. Next to me are the Bullock Draggers, the first and second laborers, the peasants, and in the ranks of those who are walking there are hundreds of sturdy guys with high flags and crosses, all of them and with them deep old men who cannot easily endure the long journey. I think of the simple and pompous marching altars before which I ever prayed as a soldier. Here beside the ruined peasant houses of Bayo is a wobbly, dilapidated, ragged table covered with the cloth of a tent. On it is a portable altar, a small stone slab with five crosses carved on it, on which the first services were held in the time of early Christianity, with relics of saints inserted beneath them 
symbolizing the burial of martyrs. During the First World War in our Alpine Corps, the military priests had their own pack horses. On one side of the saddle was placed a well-made crate with items for worship, on the other side was the officer's suitcase, and tent cloths and blankets or a feed sack were strapped on top. These crates served as altars at the foot of Monte Matajur, Moptitamba, or in one of the high mountain valleys of the Dolomites. In a French country palace, a magnificent Renaissance table served as an altar. On the Somme near Epaid, it was an old cupboard placed sideways. At Amiens during the First World War, it was the high altar in the cathedral. In all the altars, however, the reliquor relics were broken into with chisels or hose. The thieves suspected, and not in vain, that their settings were gold with precious stones. The harmonium standing in front of the church pulpit, which was of marvelous workmanship, had been smashed, and the sacristy had been broken into. We slid the iron grating between the choir and the nave again. It also bore the marks of the hard work of the robbers. There was nothing to think of in the way of worship, all the more so when Pastor Ibn Emil spoke with indignation about the treacherous violation of neutrality on May 10 and 11, 1940, when this Belgian fort was captured in the first airborne operation using heavy gliders. These memories came over me at Stalingrad. Everywhere, the German soldier's boot stepped with sacrilege and sacrilege. Such is one of the many dark chapters of our glorious German history, and no worship can hide it from memory. The work of our hands. Since the middle of December, the enemy's activity has increased enormously. One day shortly before dawn, right in front of our command post, a Soviet tank with a troop of infantry suddenly appeared out of the fog. The soldiers in the snowy trenches were crushed. The Soviet assault group tried to break into the houses and ruins of the southern part of Mitrievka. Its sudden appearance caused us an incredible commotion. Almost always such attacks are preceded by a heavy fire attack by batteries of multi-barrel rocket launchers, the so-called Stalin organs, which forces everyone to huddle to the ground. We know from experience that this fire support will last until the last moment, that is, until the Soviet soldiers rush into the still smoking craters and shrapnel-covered areas to capture our positions or areas of defense. In such operations, artificial fog is used depending on the weather and wind direction. For camouflage purposes, smoke shells are also fired where no offensive is actually planned. In this way, the enemy achieves an exceptionally strong dispersion of our forces and finds enough weak points to inflict heavy losses in men and material on us. Between Christmas and New Year's we sit in our low bunker made of small warped tree trunks, rotten and moldy from dampness. The gaps between the trunks are plugged with grass to keep the earth from falling. But what we proudly call a bunker is at best a cellar for storing potatoes, cabbage, and onions. One exhausting night as we talked with Fernberg, I noticed that he was looking at me questioningly, proddingly, almost incredulously. From the expression of his face, which in the light of the oil flasher seemed pale yellow, I realized that he was tormented by his conscience. Finally, he interrupted the oppressive silence, asking a question slowly and in a tone that already predetermined the answer. So I killed people, destroyed people, quite deliberately. The conversation was not going well. Obviously, we were drawn to the same thing. He probably saw a reflection of his thoughts on my face. Wernberg is a businessman. He also served as an artilleryman in World War I. If an enemy battery goes silent, a tank catches fire, houses collapse and bridges go up, it is his success. Of course, he often saw through binoculars or a stereo tube how his shells killed people. More than once he had the opportunity to see for himself the devastating effect of his guns. He saw the corpses of men and horses, burning vehicles, and torn up ground smelling of gunpowder. However, he personally did not shoot at people. Only here in the cauldron, he had to use pistols. The enemy broke through and from all sides rushed on one of his batteries. Wernberg suddenly found himself in a crater over one Soviet soldier, whom he shot in the chest. The Red Army man muttered something incomprehensible and died before his eyes. This shocked Wernberg, deeply disturbed him.
He probably knew that in order to win a war, one had to kill. But he had never directly participated in it before. Yes, Wernberg, you're right. The farther one gets from the front, the less one thinks about the ruthless, brutal actions for which we are all being trained. But each of us has to reflect on it at some point. And as soon as it happens, fear creeps in, guilt takes over. And it presses in, haunts us for weeks, months, years. And in this war, the blame is on us. Maybe what's happening here in the cauldron is a deserved punishment for the injustices we've done or have done to ourselves. You know, Werneberg, I still haven't forgotten the first battles of March and April 1917. It was at Armentier Bayou. Our Royal Bavarian Infantry Leopold in heavy, large nail-lined boots and leather pants, with pack horses loaded to the brim and light machine gun wagons, marched through the town. We had come from Vosges to seize Belgian Flanders land, to advance on Mont Rouge and Mont Noir. The aim of our operation was to reach the sea. The offensive began at seven o'clock in the morning. Before the fog cleared, concentrated fire from mortars and grenade launchers, machine guns and mountain guns fell on the enemy positions. Five minutes later, the infantry was to launch an attack to break the last resistance. I was in a machine gun formation and saw machine gun bursts hitting exactly on target. Every tenth bullet was a tracer. The Canadians rushed to escape, fell, and only a few got up again. I fired ribbon after ribbon. After the fire raid, our riflemen rushed into the enemy positions, and in a few minutes we saw dead Canadians with mangled faces, mangled bodies, and shot helmets. Some were still alive. One, badly wounded in the shoulder, was leaning against a birch tree. Suddenly I began to shake my whole body like a madman like a paralyzed man. So that's what our job is. This is what we were brought up for. This is what we are commanded for. This is what we think is right. The road to the canal passed through corpses and through the wounded. The pictures that unfolded before me did not leave me all day, for weeks and months. I saw them even in my dreams. I interrupt the conversation. What is the use of rummaging through the memories that had so depressingly affected me in my youth? The anxiety I feel at these memories forces me out of the bunker. I need to return to reality, to put my thoughts in order. And yet the images of the past haunt my mind. Suddenly I remember a broad-shouldered ober effereator from the regiment's communications platoon. His face is contorted with pain. He screams loudly. I can see him clutching the innards falling out of his body with his outstretched hands, catching air with his mouth and shrilly screaming for help, staggering a few steps forward. Mr. Colonel, Mr. Colonel, help me. I want to go home. Help, help. I want to go home. Oh, mother, mother. But it is impossible to help him. There is fierce fighting all around, near Logovsky, along the country road to Melo Logovsky. Again, contrary to our assessment of the enemy, the Soviet troops suddenly cut in south of the Don striking from the flank, and all the time in the scourge-like clicking of machine gun and machine gun bursts I hear a piercing cry. Oh, mama, mama, when we leave the high-rise, I once again pass by the place where the soldier died. Never will I forget that behind that desperate call to his mother was a ruthless question directed at those in command. In the name of what? How agonizing that question can be. And it will not be answered by the commander the father of the family himself, nor by the military priest who gives absolution, nor by friends with whom such experiences had already been talked about after the First World War. There is no answer to it in the books, and we take comfort in the fact that until the last minute we fulfill our duty to our nation and fatherland, now to the Fuhrer. As the oath requires, the wounded in the vegetable storehouse, on the western outskirts of Dmitrievka, between the burnt-out buildings of the collective farm, there is a large half-dug-in vegetable storehouse with partitions, apparently for storing root crops, fodder stocks, and everything that a large farm must store for a long winter. Hundreds of severely wounded men had to be housed there, lying close together in two or three close rows. The front boards of the partitions were torn off to make it more convenient to attend to the wounded, 
The whole of the structure, which adjoins the western slope, with the exception of the flat roof, is covered with snow. This somewhat protects it from artillery fire and stray bullets. The snow in front of the entrance is trampled but mixed with garbage, bloody scraps of bandages, empty tin cans and scraps of clothing. It all blended into a foul-smelling foul mass. It was as if you were standing not near the infirmary, but at a garbage pit. Doctors and orderlies, together with order lice carriers, make great efforts to restore some order, but they do not succeed. Just outside the entrance, to the right and left, are the rooms for doctors and orderlies. These are completely unequipped utility rooms. They are only suitable for sitting down in a corner and having a little sleep. If anyone wanted to lie down, he would have to find a place near the wounded. The holes hollowed out in the wall, replacing windows, scarcely light the structure 50 meters long, so that kerosene lamps are hung in various places. At the very end of the aisle, a gasoline generator is running, providing electric light for the operating line. As I squeezed through here, I thought I had entered an underground mine, the site of a disaster. To my surprise, there are a few nurses here as well. If they weren't standing just in the light, it would be impossible to recognize whether they are men or women working here. Their faces are pale, tired, sad, and stern. At first I did not believe that there were Russians among them. Now is not the time to ask where they are from, why they stayed, or who detained them. They help hard, diligently, tirelessly. Among them one elderly woman, broad in the shoulders and somewhat bent, probably under the weight of her years, catches the eye. At this time, a soldier, severely wounded in the chest and legs, was being treated. From behind the partitions, lamentations and groans could be heard. In spite of this, everything is done here as it should be done, and with iron calm. The stifling air becomes unbearable when the soldier is stripped of his last rags. We can spend half an hour with the wounded. Conversation does not go well. Russian women sit with us in silence. Everyone is trying to distract themselves for a few moments from the complaints and moans of the wounded. I can't take my eyes off the old Russian woman. The expression of her face, her absent gaze, show that she is experiencing the kind of human feelings that perhaps only a mother shows toward a helpless child. Behind her purely mechanical movements one can guess her feelings, her suffering, her mute weeping, her muffled cry for the thousandfold suffering inflicted on her and all Russian people. It is as if she does not react to what is happening around her. Absent-mindedly, she looks here and there, back and forth on the table, then at the wounded who need care and whom she would like to comfort, as she once comforted her sons. It is still light, and I wait until it is dark to go to the company command post, located on Cossack Mound. The road there goes through winding hollows and reaches a trench, a shallow depression reinforced with sandbags and planks. You can only crawl into the trench and you have to squat. Company commander, I brought a New Year's gift, a loaf of bread and a can of canned meat, which the day before I gave General Von Daniels. We do not know what to talk to each other about. There is the total unknown ahead, and one dares not think of the past. I understand the young lieutenant's condition. He longs for his homeland, a reunion with which is a pipe dream. There now they light Christmas candles, short burns, because in this war winter candles are very expensive. Everyone is thinking about his family, his homeland, his friend. The next morning I am visited again by the division commander. The overcast weather allows to sneak unnoticed along the road from Nitrivka to the forward positions. Daniel certainly wants to take another look at Verdiaki and says that it is not too late to break through. As for the promise to unblock us, it has not been fulfilled, and this, he says, is a great piggishness. We hear German speech. Shortly after New Year's Day, a lieutenant and a non-commissioned officer from an advanced observation post south of the road between Mitrievka and Peskovaka decided to inform me confidentially of something very important. The night before, sometime between 9 and 10 p.m., they had heard German speech from the Soviet side. Apparently a megaphone had been used. In spite of the strong westerly wind, individual words could be heard well. 
The speaker described himself as a German who wanted to appeal to the German soldiers, to his German brothers. He claimed that the situation of those surrounded was hopeless. Manstein's attempts to break through had failed. There is no outside help. Hitler had betrayed the soldiers in the cauldron. Further resistance is pointless. The only salvation, to stop it. Phrases like this were repeated several times. What do I think about it? Could there be Germans there? Asked the lieutenant. The lieutenant and the non-commissioned officer suggested that a German might have been making the transmission, though I immediately told them that it might well have been a Russian. Were there no German speakers among the prisoners of war? Maybe it was just an attempt to frighten us or mislead us. Either way, we must keep an eye on what happens next. It is not excluded that the transmission will be repeated, or maybe it will be possible to jam it. This is quite possible, as the direction is not difficult to establish, and the distance will have to be determined approximately. I asked the lieutenant if he knew if the infantry in our immediate vicinity were aware of these transmissions. This was answered in the negative, but the lieutenant immediately added that he had not spoken to anyone about it. I observed that the man making the broadcast was certainly not acting alone. It is possible that he is speaking from a snowy trench ahead of the Soviet front line. All this is possible, said the lieutenant, but in this way it was possible to learn something about our position. Some people might be interested in the transmissions from the Russian side, and that would clarify our position. The lieutenant looks at me questioningly and somewhat uncertainly. He is obviously frightened by his boldness. What to do? I say that I will make appropriate inquiries with the company commanders and that, apparently, it is necessary to issue an order to shell the area from where the voice is heard. If the transmission is repeated, we should open fire with heavy infantry weapons. That will silence the transmission. This is amazing. Is that really where the German is coming from? The conversation ends with me giving orders to report to me immediately and at any time by any kind of communication if the transmission is repeated. I then reach the infantry platoon commanded by Lieutenant Heidelberger. Only fragments of the transmission were heard there. Apparently a strong wind interfered. Perhaps the platoon is located away from the transmitter. It turns out, however, that everyone heard the transmission at the same time. The first to notice the transmission was the machine gun crew, who thought at first that it was our comrades shouting. Perhaps, while on a reconnaissance mission, they had deviated from their intended route and now needed help. I give orders. In every case, report directly to me. We need to find out what's going on. After my return late at night to Dmitrievka to the regimental headquarters, we discuss what happened. We remember that back in October, a soldier of our division was in Soviet captivity for several days and then suddenly at night returned to our positions. This soldier was from an infantry platoon that was conducting a night reconnaissance near Melokletskaya. There he was taken prisoner. He was not wounded. The commander of the company on whose station this soldier appeared about three o'clock in the morning brought him to me because the soldier's statements seemed doubtful to him. The soldier claimed that he had been treated well in captivity. He was not subjected to extensive interrogation. He met some German soldiers there who were also treated well, but then they were separated. Clearly he saw something that he did not know before. He himself was asked if he wanted to go back to his company. The Red Army already has so many German prisoners that they don't need him. He might well be sent back. When he gets back to his company, he'll have to tell what he's seen and heard. It is clear that Hitler miscalculated by sending so many German soldiers to the Don, thousands of kilometers away from Germany. This could bring great misfortune to Germany. Would it not be better and smarter to end it? At any rate, there is nothing for the German to do in the Don step. That was roughly the soldier's message. It coincided with what he told on his return to the front line. There he was bombarded with questions. Are the Russians well armed? What were they feeding you? Were you pressured? Were you threatened? How did you get back and forth across the Don? How deep were you in the rear? The soldier answered that he had traveled about an hour at night to the rear in a jeep with a Soviet officer. Back he had been delivered also at night. I wanted, however, 
to learn more from him. This was helped by a happy accident. The soldier spoke a Swabian dialect, roughly the way the people of Alga speak. Everything he said about his homeland and what he said to my questions, which required detailed answers, I could confirm from my own life experience. He was not lying. And I asked myself, what do the Russians want to achieve? What are their intentions? A few days later, I was informed by telephone that German voices were heard again. I immediately went by motorcycle to the observation post. However, the CP had changed position, as the previous one had been completely destroyed by artillery. I managed to hear the last phrases. From the Russian side reminded, warned, demanded. The same was heard in the infantry units. At first I wanted to keep silent about these incidents, but the next morning the same type of reports came from neighboring regiments. Therefore, something had to be done. That same night, together with the commander of the artillery division, Lieutenant Colonel Vernberg, and the commander of the rifle company discussed the situation. On the map, I marked three sectors of shelling. The distances between the transmitters and our front line are probably 200 to 600 meters. It can be assumed, however, that the speaker is not working with a megaphone, but is using a remote speaker that is set up somewhere off to the side at night. This appears to be the case, since firing a machine gun in the direction from which the voice was heard was ineffective. We will attempt to interrupt the transmission with disturbing fire. From the division headquarters immediately requested why we opened fire with small arms and artillery. In order to answer the inquiries of the division headquarters, I visited the front line twice more before January 7, the last time, in a snow trench, on the height of the southern slope of the Cossack Kurgan Spur. From there again came a voice insistently urging us to come to our senses and stop resistance. Continued resistance is pure suicide. The Red Army is advancing further and further to the west and thus destroys the last hopes for unblocking. We don't know who is broadcasting. The first phrases with which he addresses us are hard to hear. And we, of course, want to know something new about the situation in the cauldron and on all fronts. Later, in Krasnogorsk prisoner of war camp, I learned who tried then in the snowy desert around the Stalingrad cauldron to put an end to senseless sacrifices and save the lives of German soldiers and officers. They were Walter Ulbricht, Eric Weinert, Willie Bredel, and with them Captain Dr. Hatterman, Oberlieutenant Horisius, and Oberlieutenant Ryer. No surrender. Open fire on the parliamentarians. At one of the commander's meetings, it was, I think, January 5, General von Daniels characterized all reports of German speeches on the part of the enemy empty chatter or cheating. Daniels is fond of using such expressions. Obviously, he believes, the Russians did not count on our stubborn resistance and now resort to such means to shake the morale of our troops. They are trying to do the same by means of leaflets. On January 8, one such leaflet was delivered to me. It contains an offer of surrender on honorable terms. The situation of your encircled troops, it says, is grave. They are experiencing hunger, disease, and cold. The harsh Russian winter is just beginning. Severe frosts, cold winds and blizzards are still ahead, and your soldiers are not provided with winter uniforms and are in severe unsanitary conditions. You as the commander and all officers of the encircled troops understand perfectly well that you have no real possibilities to break the encirclement ring. Your situation is hopeless, and further resistance is of no use. All this is true. On the same day, General von Daniels comes to me with a leaflet in his hands. Read it, please, Stiedel. What insolence. No one will accept the parliamentarians. The army headquarters has given instructions to use weapons against them. And if any of us tries to negotiate with the Russians, he will be shot immediately. The order to that effect is already in place. What will we come to, Stiedel? if everyone tries to negotiate with the Russians as he sees fit. That same evening comes such an order for the division. I decide not to announce it to my regiment. Like the officers of my staff, I resent its contents. It clearly violates international conventions. 
Besides, both the leaflet and the man who transmitted it from the Russian trenches are absolutely right. Our situation is desperate. The condition of our troops is catastrophic. In the battles for Dmitriyevka, the personnel of my regiment was reduced to 15 to 20 percent. Replenishment at the expense of soldiers and junior commanders from already disbanded military units is worth little, as they have not yet recovered from the experience. But even leaving that aside, they are not properly trained and equipped for combat. Six weeks without a shift of continuous heavy defensive fighting robs any military unit of its fighting ability. General Von Daniel seems to understand our situation. I will do everything to achieve a change of regiment, he told me at the last meeting. And indeed, on the night of 8 to 9 January, appears Lieutenant General Lyser, commander of the 29th Motorized Division, who is ordered to take charge of the battle. He thinks that for this purpose it is enough at the command post of the regiment to familiarize himself with the operational situation. But it cannot be limited to this here. After all, the area, which we, suffering heavy losses, defending for six weeks, must be held. Here every detail is important. Any even small experience. There is no continuous line of fortifications here. There are only snow trenches, small gullies and hollows. Supply, evacuation of the wounded is possible only at night. And every time, it is necessary to give exact reference points. Storms change the appearance of the landscape. Otherwise people will not get to the trenches, will fall under enemy fire, or, having lost strength, will freeze. Observation posts. Yes, there are, but only a few good ones, it is very difficult to use them, as the Russians are holding us under fire. Our line of defense is a number of strongholds of rifle squads south of Cossack Kurgan, to the highway, Dmitrievka, Peskovaka, and directly at the junction with the 3rd Motorized Division. And then, of course, there are the 388mm guns, already dug into the ground for six weeks and adapted for all round defense. They can hit tanks by direct fire. All the time we have to reckon with surprise attacks, mostly at night and even in fog and snowfall. Attacks on Mitrievka are not excluded. What else can I say to the senior commander? That it is necessary to patrol the snow trenches at night, to wake up the soldiers, so that they do not fall asleep, do not freeze, or were not caught by surprise by the enemy. And yet here and there after an hour Soviet machine gunners opened fire. On January 9, as soon as it got dark, we withdrew from our positions with the task of building a rear defensive line on the eastern bank of the Rizoshka River near Novo Aleksivskoy. A major new Soviet offensive is imminent. After the rejection of the surrender offer, it is inevitable. The last battle for Stalingrad. On January 10 at 8 hours and 5 minutes the Russians begin an artillery bombardment even stronger than on November 19 to 55 minutes of howling Stalin's organs, rumbling heavy guns, without interruption volley after volley. Hurricane fire plowed over the whole ground. The last assault on the cauldron began. Then the gun thunder is silenced, white painted tanks are approaching, followed by machine gunners in camouflage coats. We leave Marinovka then Mitrievka. All living things are dragging to the Rasashka Valley. We are entrenched at Dubinin, and two days later we find ourselves in the area of the station nursery in Tolovaya Gully. The boiler gradually shrinks from west to east, on the 15th to Rasashka, on the 18th to the line Voropanovo. Potomnik. Goncher's Farm, on the 22nd to Verknielchash. Gumrak. Then we give up Gumrak. The last opportunity by airplanes to take out the wounded and receive ammunition and food disappears. January 16, our division ceases to exist. I am appointed commander of the combat group, which brought together the remnants of my division and other broken parts. Its task is to ensure the exit from the encirclement of the army headquarters, a plan that was discussed on January 22 in one of the gullies Tolovaya Gully. Rumor has it that the remnants of the encircled 6th Army should try to break through either in the direction of Kelek or Verkhnitseritsinsky. 
even an absurd plan to direct the defending units in the north of the cauldron to march down the frozen Volga is being discussed. Everyone has gone mad. So comments Colonel Bulyu this plan, which was never realized. The decomposition intensifies. Other officers, such as Major Wolutsky, Chief of Operations at our division headquarters, escape by airplane. After the loss of the nursery, airplanes land in Gumrak, which the Russians continuously bombard. Other officers, after the disbandment of their units, sneak away to Stalingrad. More and more officers want to make their way alone to the receding German front. There are such in my combat group. By chance I become aware that the treasurer of my regiment is conspiring with two comrades. They know the area up to the Don, they know a few words in Russian, and therefore expect to change into Soviet military uniforms and make their way to their own. In vain I persuade them to abandon this crazy idea. After all, it is suicide to hope that in the Russian winter the three of them will make their way hundreds of kilometers across enemy territory to their front. They insist even more on their long-conceived plan, asking me not to give them away. Their fate is not known to me. Increasingly confused, I tell Strang and Urban to prepare for another retreat. My traveling suitcase will not be saved, but now, I don't need it. The essentials are carried on me. A second shirt and two pairs of underpants, the last clean socks I stuffed in the pockets of my overcoat, a thick woolen scarf around my neck. Suddenly I remember a battle in the mountains between Monte Tomba and Monte Grappa in Italy in 1917. It took place on a stormy night. We managed with great precautions, lest we be noticed by an incredibly skillful enemy, to pick up the corpse of my schoolmate and classmate Count Monchilas, a pupil of the Corps of Pages at Munich, an institution for the sons of the royal house and nobility, Lieutenant Monchilas, who had no military experience, was sent to us two days before the battle. The Italians at night threw hand grenades at this inexperienced lieutenant's unit. Monchelis had the same soft, warm, hand-knitted scarf. When we found him, the scarf, soaked with blood, had already frozen to his chest and neck. This painful memory torments me. Will the same fate befall me? My confidence, my optimism, it seems, begins to give up. I feel a deep depression literally enveloping me. I nervously rummage through my suitcase. What's this all about? Why do I need this box of watercolors and a super strong magnifying glass? What's the point of the cloth bag with orders and insignia? After all, the order bars are sewn on the tunic. There is no need now for the statutes with which I have not parted since the military school. I throw the letters into the fire, but at the bottom of the suitcase I find two books, among them, Main Camp Hitler and a small icon, which I bought for two rubles in Bogachar. I already wanted to throw Main Camp into the fire, but what would it do me? Let the Russians see what there is in the suitcase of a German colonel. January 23 comes the order. At dawn, the remaining parts of the 376th Infantry Division under the command of the commander of the 767th Grenadier Regiment, if possible for one transition to withdraw to the area immediately west of the commandant stalling Red West. Further orders will be received on the spot. We feel relieved. It seems as if now order will come. Just the word Stalingrad calms us down. There are houses, there is shelter and, of course, food. Weapons and ammunition are less important. When the soldiers pass us, I feel better. We join the rear guard. Now the retreat looks not like a flight from the enemy, but a planned orderly withdrawal from the front line. Probably in Stalingrad we'll rest and be replaced. Yes, we're going to Stalingrad. None of us have seen this city until now. The pace is not particularly fast, but the front is getting farther away by the hour. I sit in the sidecar of the motorcycle, which leads string and suddenly feel that I have reached a point. The nerves can no longer withstand. Exhausted and exhausted, I'm shaking with my whole body. I don't even have the strength to ask for help. Strang apparently notices this. He turns to the side and stops. I feel him put his right hand on my shoulder and shake me vigorously. 
Come to your senses, Mr. Colonel. Everything is fine. We'll be able to rest now. The last days were too hard, but now we will be in Stalingrad. He turns on the engine, and I feel the cold wind turning my scarf, tied high and wet at the chin, into ice. At the intersection, I shift into the rover. I've already gotten over myself. Strang and Urban stay in the motorcycle. To me sit Wernberg and my old front comrade Colonel Weber. And there is almost nothing left of his regiment of the 100th Jager Division.